Hi, everybody. It's so good to see so many familiar faces. Um, thanks for joining us for this hour where we um, remember and celebrate Tom Bell. So um, I have a very short PowerPoint that just um, kind of highlights the key parts of Tom's life, but it's just a 30,000 foot look. Um, I'm gonna get to the panelists as soon as I can because they have some amazing memories and stories. And then at the end, um, we're happy to take questions and throughout, if you have a question, just post it in the chat. Okay, I'm going to start here. Whoops. I have to share my screen first. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, so this is um, one of my favorite pictures of Tom. And Tom um, was born in Winton, Wyoming, which is a small, I'm not even sure it's still on the map. It was a small coal mining company town north of Rock Springs. Um, his dad, Leif, worked in the general store. His mom was a waitress. Um, both his grandfather and his dad had worked um, as coal miners. Um, but just a few years later, they moved um, to Milford, which is just outside of Lander on a ranch and Tom graduated from the Fremont County Vocational High School. And um, this is just a great young picture of tall skinny Tom. In 1942, Tom enlisted in the Army Air Corps. He served 22 missions as a bombardier. And in one of those missions um, was wounded he caught shrapnel through the bubble of the plane, um, which hit his face. He lost a lot of blood. Um, both his eyes were damaged. Um, but in the stories that he told, because it was so cold that high up in the air, in that little um, bubble cockpit, uh, the freezing temperature saved his life. Um, he did end up losing one eye but he was told that he might never see again. And um, when he did regain his vision, um, after he had returned to Wyoming, he was interviewed and he said, getting his vision back solidified his love for Wyoming and specifically for the Red Desert where he went after the war to recover from his emotional scars. Tom said it was very important to see the beautiful earth. And he was awarded um, the Silver Star um, for his bravery and gallantry. When he returned from the war, um, he enrolled at the University of Wyoming and he met and married um, Muriel, who went by Tommy in um, 1947. And when I was talking to Rachel, um, she remembered when she would answer the phone at home, um, often whoever was calling asked for Tommy. And both Tom and his wife, Tommy, went by Tommy. So she always had to say, which Tommy? <laughs> um, they, she, he then graduated the year after with a wildlife degree. And in pretty short succession, his first three kiddos uh, hit the scene, Alan, David, and Jim. Um, those sons live and Rachel can correct me, but in Washington State and Utah, and one lives in Casper right now. Um, Tom earned a master's degree in 1957, again from the university, and you can see the three boys growing up a little bit in that photo. He worked for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Um, he served two stints with them for a total of maybe about five and a half years is what I learned. Um, let's see if I have, I do have a, a statement that I think you'll all appreciate. Um, he was both an upland game biologist and a fisheries biologist. Um, but 
he wouldn't be Tom Bell if he didn't resist the political influences that he believed corrupted the science of that agency at the time. Um, he once had a face-off with some of his supervisors around the issue of magpies, um, which prey on pheasant nests and chicks. His bosses wanted him to destroy the magpie nests so that hunters could have more pheasants. Tom told them it violated ecological principles. He said, the reality is magpies will get some pheasant nests, but if you have good pheasant habitat, they can hide their nests well enough and you'll have plenty of pheasants. He said, it made me so mad. He ultimately quit the department, um, but not before telling a game and fish commissioner to go to hell. <laughs> He was a science teacher in Lander for 13 years. And Rachel explained to me that of the five, of the six kids um, Tom and Tommy eventually had, he ended up teaching um, science to five of them. Um, I think Rachel was the exception to that. So now we're into the 1960s and Tom Bell is seeing like so many others at the time, um, some really concerning state of affairs across the state of Wyoming. Um, he was observing and documenting illegal fencing on public lands where pronghorn were getting caught up and dying slow and painful deaths. Um, there were strip mine, coal strip mine proposals, uh, a lot of clear cutting on the national forests, especially around Dubois. Um, a proposal that some of you will remember to detonate a nuclear explosion to help release the gas um, caught in the tight shale formation of the upper green. Um, some water proposals um, to divert water from the green um, across the continental divide. And then poisoning or shooting of eagles um, to protect livestock. So Tom was concerned about all of these issues and um, ultimately founded the Wyoming Outdoor Council. Um, he ran the organization for the first four years. Um, he said in 1970, I view conservation not just as a job nor as an avocation, but as a way of life and a means to survival for the human race. It is a deadly serious business in which a person must be willing to sacrifice personally as well as economically. Just two years later, Tom purchases what was um, a magazine called Camping News Weekly and he renames it the next year to High Country News. And in those early years, um, Tom was an inspiration to so many. Um, Keith Becker, who was the Wyoming Outdoor Council's first um, executive director said about Tom, no one could threaten him. He was absolutely fearless and confrontational. He acted as if he had nothing to lose. Tom was so earnest that he was able to disarm people. Tom and Tommy adopted Vic and Rachel and Christine, and then the family moves to Oregon where they live for the next 10 years. Um, Tom was a very religious man. He became a born again Christian in 1974. And then he ended up moving the family back to Lander um, in the early eighties. And then Tom lived in Lander for the next 33 years, um, the remainder of his life, he worked for the Pioneer Museum and served as an emeritus board member um, on both the Walk and the High Country News Board. He died in 2016 and he was 92 and his ashes were released um, over the Oregon Buttes in the Red Desert. So I'm going to turn at this point to our panelists and I'm gonna ask Rachel to start us off. Um, Rachel was born in Cheyenne and was adopted by Tom and Tommy Bell when she was four years old. 
She spent most of her childhood on the family farm in Richland, Oregon. When she was 15, they moved back to Lander and she graduated from Lander Valley High School. She got married and had three kids. She worked for the hospital for 20 years and she lives with her husband, Andy, to this day in Lander and their children and seven grandchildren also all live in Lander. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, let's see. Okay, great, cool. I was gonna say, I can't see, but now I can see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as you all know, I'm Rachel. I'm um, the oldest daughter and the, um, the oldest adopted daughter. My dad, as everybody knows, um, you, you all think of dad as Wyoming Outdoor Council or the High Country News, and some as Mr. Bell, the science teacher. But to me, he was just dad, good old dad. <laughs> Yeah, um, he adopted myself in 1971 and Chris. Chris was three, I was four. Vic was adopted as an infant seven years before. Um, they had three biological sons and they all were gone by the time that we had come. Um, Alan, who is the oldest, was, is, he's still alive, 18 years <laughs> older than I am. And Alan, to me, looks a lot like you, Paul. You look so, you could be my dad's son. You look a lot like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of people will refer to us adopted kids as dad's second family, but he didn't like that at all. He just referred to us as we were all his. We weren't adopted. We were his kids. In 1973, he moved us out to Oregon to give farming a try. We, when we arrived, we arrived in halfway Oregon and in a very small trailer with no running water. So we would go down to the creek, dad and Vic would go first to bathe, and then it was um, mom, myself, and Chris. And it was cold. And thank goodness that didn't last for very long. <laughs> dad found us a farm and a much better house in Richland, Oregon, and that's where we lived. In Richland, we had, dad had us living off of the farm. We had two very large gardens, and we and chickens and we sold the produce and the eggs when the chick, chickens stopped laying we ate them and they were good <laughs> uh, we had a dairy cow for milk and we raised a calf and a pig every year and had them butchered in the fall dad believed in being self-sufficient he taught us to work hard and take pride in our work he ta also taught us to be self-reliant -re and that wasting resources was um, a sin and that our, in our world, our environment is a gift and we should cherish and protect it. I know at the time when I was living there, I didn't enjoy it. But when I look back on it, it really was a lot of fun. And believe it or not, I even miss it sometimes. <laughs> um, Richland, I can't... Richland was small, smaller than Hudson. So, and then we didn't even live in town. We lived out of town. So to go anywhere, you either rode your bike on gravel, which paved the town of Richland. The only paved part was Richland itself. We lived on a gravel road. So dad had to change a lot of tires on our bikes. <laughs> but, we, and if we ever said that I got bored, which I didn't because dad had us a lot, had a lot for us to do, especially in the summer on the garden and all that kind of stuff. But um, he did find us stuff to do, not only for us kids, but for the kids in Richland. So dad um, purchased us, he must have rented a building in, in Richland and then he purchased a projector and he would once a week, once a night during the week, would play movies for us and mom would pop the popcorn. So we would see a lot of um, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis movies. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we would, the fond memories I also have of dad, of just me and dad was walking down to the barn to milk the cow and also to um, get the chickens or not the chickens, well, yeah, the chickens, but to, um, go get the eggs, which is one thing I didn't like because when I had to go by myself and I would always wait till the last minute. So they're always, you know, up there in their nest or whatever. And I hated putting my hand 
underneath there to get those eggs. It was not fun for me. I didn't like it. <laughs> um, and then I always was the one that seemed to get um, help butcher the chickens also. And it's true, they do run around with not their heads all over the place. <laughs> so, but sadly the um, farming didn't pay the bills. So dad did have to go back to teaching and he did go back to school. And boy, was he one smart person because he got perfect. And I mean, perfect grades, straight A's all the way across. So not only did I get his, not only did I not get his skinny gene, I didn't get his smart gene either. <laughs> But so dad um, taught um, English and science sixth through eighth grade. And he had a reputation for being a hard teacher, but um, also a lot of his students would say that he was one of their favorite teachers. Then we um, came back um, in 83. I was 15 years old when we came back. I was not happy to come back because I'd left all of my friends but I did make some great friends and I still have a lot of them today. Um, you know, I was very blessed to have dad, Tom Bell, dad. Um, I wasn't born with him as my dad. I wasn't gonna cry and I'm sorry, but I'm very blessed that he was my father. He was a great guy. And he made a difference to all of you guys, and it definitely a difference to me. And he treasures every single person that he met. So there you go. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I'm really appreciative. You're welcome. Okay, uh, let me now if I might um, introduce Barb Parsons. Whoops. I'm gonna scroll through these again so you can all get a picture of Barb, who's also on the screen, but. Oop. Well, that's fine. Okay, so Barb. Um, served on the Wyoming Outdoor Council Board for 25 years. In the 90s, she was appointed to the BLM Resource Advisory Council, the RAC for Wyoming by Bruce Babbitt, and was appointed to the State Ag Coordinated Resource Advisory Council, figure out that acronym, and was appointed to the first state school lands committee by the state land board. She was also appointed to the South Central Sage Grouse Working Group in 2004 and remains a member to this day. During those walk years, she became good friends with Tom Bell. Um, Barb, I believe you were born in Laramie, but have lived the majority of your life in Rollins. In 64. In 64. So welcome. And um, can't wait to hear your, your stories. So I'm waiting. Oh, I'm sorry. It's your turn. Okay. I just, you were on the screen. I'm not. Oh, huh. Well, I, anyway, we, we can all see you, Barb. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you. And I want to apologize in advance for following a script, but I feel like Tom deserves precision and not my rambling remarks. And I can get rather wordy sometimes. I've given a lot of thought about what to share with you about Tom obviously was a warrior. We talked about him being a war hero and he fought for environmental and social justice all of his life. And I often think it's overlooked that he was a very deeply religious man. And that belief, I believe, uh, defined his stewardship uh, during our environmental causes and the work that we did. As Lisa said, over 50 years ago, he and others who shared his belief realized that they had a much bigger voice together than alone. And together they formed the, uh, the environmental coalition called the Wyoming Outdoor Coordinating Council. And in 1986, just before I came on the board, they formed their own nonprofit from those people 
and um, became the Wyoming Outdoor Council, dropped the coordinating. But it, uh, the uh, coalitions that were formed remained very important all the time that I was on the board. Tom was in Oregon, and I didn't realize that he, until just now, that he was actually in Lander when I became a board member because he didn't, he wasn't at those meetings right away, but at some point he started attending the board meetings and it became an apparent that he was going to be a full participant again and not just an honorary emeritus one. And thus became a friendship that I really treasured. Tom could be feisty and confrontational, but he could also take a very thoughtful approach. And an example that comes to my mind is the grazing policy. And I was happy to see Joyce, a rancher, sitting here because she will relate to the fact that many of our board members have come from the ranching community and they have done their best to be environmental stewards. So Tom suggested the adopted policy. The Wyoming Outdoor Council is against removal of livestock from public lands, but in favor of a review of good management practices that will improve the condition of the land. Board service can be a real eye opener. I'm sure that Tom found that to be true, but he, and he was a very good board member. But over the years, I found that environmental advocates are passionate people, but often come to the organization as very naive and believe the, that folks can be educated and sweet talked into doing the right thing. This actually became a very divisive issue at one point. We had a director who opposed lawsuits as one of the tools in our toolbox. Then a lawsuit loomed with a power plant and the board divided into a couple of camps. The old heads like Tom and I, and his daughter talked about how feisty he is. We knew it was folly to try to sweet talk them. They had a track record. Instead of using the best available technology, that plant and others like them have been compromising our air quality for years. And they have been major contributors to climate change. We sued and we won, but our director left. This legal approach is often debated. Tom and I were willing to work for consensus, but we understood that environmental advocacy work is not like the legislative arena where compromise is the norm. Instead, we are defending our human right to clean air, water, and a healthy functioning ecosystem for all life. Tom was a voracious reader of the latest scientific research. I don't think he ever stopped reading to it until his dying day. And he knew the climate crisis was coming. He warned of it. But you know, there's not in very much solace in being right. And toward the end of his life, he was often depressed. He knew that the climate had reached a critical tipping point and he felt his life's work was for nothing. He often called and talked about it. It really broke my heart to see his life ending on that note. He gave, I, I, I'm not sure that I comforted him, but I assured him over and over again that he'd done his very best. He gave an eye to service of his country. He spent a lifetime fighting for the environment and he even exhausted his own personal resources fighting for his beliefs. And you know, none of us can do anything more than that. That is why he is our hero. And that is why the Wyoming Outdoor Council remains an effective voice in Wyoming. Thank you. Barb, thank you. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. Okay, we are going to next hear from Paul Larimer. Um, Paul is the Senior Development Officer for High Country News, which if those of you don't know, is an award-winning nonprofit news organization founded by Tom Bell 
1970, and it continues to do in-depth coverage of issues affecting the Western United States. Between 2002 and 2020, Paul served as the publisher and executive director of High Country News, turning it into a thriving magazine with more than 35,000 subscribers, 400,000 visitors a month to its website, and an, and an annual budget of $4.4 million. A far cry from Camping News Weekly, I imagine. Paul started as an intern at High Country News in 1984, returning as an editor in 1992. He's lived the last 30 years in the small coal mining and weed growing town of Paonia, Colorado, where he rock hounds, takes numerous photos of the landscape and sings in a rock and roll and blues band. Welcome Paul, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here um, and to see all of you. Um, and uh, before I get started, I see that Bruce Hamilton is here too. He may have some better tales of early high country news days than I do. So Bruce, at some point, feel free to jump in. Um, I was just thinking of all of what you guys all talked about, Tom being a warrior and to the point of depression, but even just uh, always saying the difficult thing. And uh, there was one time I visited Tom and of course he had those birds, those canaries or wherever the hell they were. Anyway, they would just sing incessantly. And uh, I, you know, Tom was a canary in the coal mine, right? I mean, you need these kinds of people to galvanize new organizations. And uh, certainly that was the case for Walk and certainly is the case for High Country News. Uh, not anybody else probably could have done that like he did, you know, and uh, uh, with the credibility that, that he had. When I was uh, in 1983, right when uh, High Country News was moving from Lander to, oh my gosh, Colorado, that soft kind of snowy place where John Denver sings. Um, I was an intern in Washington, D.C., working for one of the environmental groups, the National Wildlife Federation. And it soon became apparent that I was not going to be a great lobbyist or that I would find a career there. But everybody was reading High Country News. It was sitting around on the desks and uh, I, would, I would read it to get background on oil and gas drilling in the, near the Tetons and different, th different things that were going on. Uh, and it was, uh, and one guy said, you know, you write okay. Maybe you wanna talk to the editors, maybe they need somebody. And of course, in that issue, there was a little ad at the bottom in the classifieds uh, that Ed and Betsy Marston, who took over the magazine from, from the Lander crew down here in Paonia, I put out saying we're desperate for interns and so I called and said well here's your desperate intern uh so you know and they invited me out to Paonia and I I knew nothing about the history of the of the paper at that point in Lander or about Tom Bell uh, and I just came out and I spent four or five months started hearing about Tom Bell and Lander of course and the struggles it was a real struggle for the Marsons at first they were a couple from New York uh and and had just moved to the west um but um that I got sent out on assignments that I, you know, I thought I was just going to cover, you know, kind of Sierra Clubbish issues, and I, and I did do plenty of those public lands issues. But Ed sent me down to Delta to to uh, figure out what's going on with the coal mining bust and how is it affecting the hospitals and businesses down in Delta, which is a little town nearby here. So it soon became clear that the West was a more complicated place uh, than than I had ever imagined it to be, and. Uh, and then later I got to meet Tom and uh, he first came to one of our board meetings up in the, when I, when I just become the publisher up in the Murie Center up at, uh, at, at the park, National Park, Teton National Park. And I got to bunk with him for a night and uh, it was great because first of all, he wasn't that tall. So I almost could see eye to eye to him. And, and, uh, and, and then also he was just uh, shared a whole bunch of stories in the night and just listened and, uh, I could tell right away there was something really kind of magical about this man. Um, and, and he gave me a lot of inspiration and, and hope to, to take on my job, which I was sort of reticent at first to do. Um, one of the stories he told me is stuck with me forever. And it was, um, well, first of all, you know, how many, he's the head of an environmental group and a, and a magazine, and yet he's a, he's a born again Christian. He loved to hunt and, and, and as a kid. He, uh, he didn't, he wasn't totally against extractive industries. 
he, he was willing to go against his fellow ranchers and yet he was a rancher. Uh, this is somebody who could jump over lines that most of us can't jump over very easily anymore and, uh, and, and be respected kind of on both sides. And uh, one time he told me when he was teaching, I guess in Lander and he was making three or 400 bucks a month. I think that's what it was to sustain the whole family there and um, said <laughs> 300 <laughs> and uh he uh, said, well, some of the teachers and I got in together and we, we put in for some uranium claims in the Green Hills or whatever the, the BLM lands near Lander there. And uh, I kind of felt bad about it, he said, because every year we'd have to get out there and take a little backhoe and dig around a little to show that we were still working the claim, you know, to keep them alive. Uh, but little did you know that, you know, High Country News would probably have died a lot earlier had it not been for those uranium claims because he sold them at one point to keep the thing going, much as he took out a second mortgage on the ranch. This is all part of the, the lore of, of High Country News that, uh, and uh, I thought that was so wonderful that High Country News is really, you know, it was it was a classic extractive broom boom that kept us going in those early days. <laughs> and of course paid our editors about 50 bucks a month or whatever it was that Bruce and Joan took on when they first got the job. Um, but, you know, kind of showing that, that uh, you know, he, he busted stereotypes and High Country News was kind of beyond the stereotype of a traditional magazine, just as I think Walk was beyond the traditions of a traditional conservation group. Um, and, uh, you know, we have our, our famous loaves and fishes story where Tom uh, and, and Bruce told this story wonderfully recently when I saw him, uh, you know, had produced what he thought was the last issue of the magazine. He was so pissed off, run out of money, just about, he threw the whole flats and everything into the trash, you know, and said, that's over, you know, and, uh, you know, he, uh, his helpers, two, two wonderful women uh, who worked with him, pulled it out of the trash can and said, Tom, you can't give up, come on. And so uh, he eventually did publish that issue. And later when he, he had in Dear Friends said that it was all over, the next day, envelopes started showing up at the office, slipped under the door, $20 bills, $50 bills, $1,000 here and there. He said he earned about $30,000 from that last plea and that kept the thing going. And so time and time again, there was sort of this miracle, almost religious aspect to why High Country News kept going. And uh, it was just it was just a beautiful thing, a story. And it was, of course, one that we've recycled about a billion times in, in the years since to keep High Country News going. And uh, uh, I just feel really fortunate. Over the years, I was able to take some of the editors and interns up to meet Tom, and we recorded him with those birds singing in the background and uh, uh, got lots of great, great interest. And, and of course, if you've ever walked into his house, his entire kitchen table is covered with papers, spread out, organized in some fashion. I have no idea how, what fashion that actually was, but, uh, and, and I know climate change was really as Barbara said, was really it for him at the end there. That's what he was studying, he was working on. Um, but, but then, uh, you know, it, toward his end, he was, it was, he was in his late 80s and I'd come in, he was back in his, he was in his home then and kind of in a, you know, couch thing, he couldn't get up much. And, uh, but the damn TV was on all the time. And there was Donald Trump railing, you know, getting ready in 2015 to, to come on. And, you know, Tom said, you know, at least he's different than the other guys, you know, uh, you know, and for, for Tom to consider that, of course, I wonder what he would think now, four or five years later, but at the time it was like, yeah, he, he you know, he's, he has sort of that libertarian, uh, not, uh, and just, he believed in regulation, of course, you know, and, and all this stuff, but he had that kind of orneriness of a Westerner that he didn't, wasn't just going to accept uh, the, the easy answer. Um, and, uh, you know, I think today, I often think still of Tom and um, actually, I, I wanted to share one other thing. I, uh, you know, in two, I think it was about 2015, 16, he left a message on my voicemail, which is still on my voicemail that just said, uh, well, Paul, you know, Thanks. I hope that everything's going okay down there. I just wanted to say hello and that I love you guys. Keep up the good work, you know. And I just kept that message on there for so long because I just loved his kind of cranky voice that was just perfect, you know. And uh, and I often wonder now, you know, how he would he would judge our our day today, you know, where um, where the political divide seems so severe. Uh, you know, where Liz Cheney is considered a moderate? No, I don't know what she's considered, but uh, 
you know that that the world has just changed and 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 uh and and the the, the rise of social media and you know can high country news and, and environmental groups really have an impact on, on the communication that is, you know, so easily wants to split us into, into different and, and not do the kind of thing where you actually go confront the rancher at the meeting or the coal miner or, or the game and fish department. Uh, you know, can we have conversations that are where you're strong, but you're also willing to listen? Uh, I don't know, you know, and I think, uh, I think of Tom being on the fierce side of that. He wasn't not a he wasn't prone to compromise right away. Of course not. But uh, he also was able to jump over those lines as um, as a genuine, authentic person. And uh, I just uh, always deeply respected that from him. And I know all my fellow editors did too. And I always wish that all of them could have gone up to Lander and, and visited Tom for for a time because I think it, it it would continue to shape uh, the work that High Country News has done. In a, in a very good way. So anyway, that's, that's all I really got. I'm happy to talk about questions. And as I said, Bruce has got all the real stories. <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. That's great. Um, and thank you for sharing the loaves and the fishes. That story is incredible. Um, and I'm so glad High Country News is still the strong publication it is today. Um, thank you. Um, okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our last panelist, Todd Gunther, and um, Todd explained that he was so naive that the first time he saw High Country News back in the 70s, he assumed it was a hippie drug culture publication. <laughs> that was a mistake. Some years later, while working closely with Tom on what became an internationally contentious preservation project, the then governor of Wyoming reportedly called Gunther, quote, that little son of a bitch in South Pass. Tom, who was used to getting that sort of thing, cackled his familiar he, 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 and commented, now you're growing up, welcome to the world. Tom was one of Todd's best friends for 25 years, and they worked shoulder to shoulder five days a week for 10 tumultuous years at the Lander Pioneer Museum. Todd is a historian, an archaeologist, and a paleoecologist who is currently on the faculty of the Alpine Science Institute at Central Wyoming College. And Todd, we're so glad you've joined us. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you everybody for being here talking about one of my favorite human beings. Um, I first met Tom at one of my very first Friends of South Pass meetings. And it was an early summer day up at South Pass, beautiful, beautiful afternoon. And, and I went and sat down by the other guy with a Stetson cowboy hat on because I figured, well, the rubes can sit in the back together. And it turned out it was Tom Bell. I had never met him face to face before. We had corresponded some and talked on the phone a few times. Uh, but that afternoon, sitting out there with the birds chirping and, and all the other beautiful South Pass uh, natural environment, um, I realized that he was, like Paul said, kind of a magical guy. And he really uh, impacted the rest of my life and, and all of my family and friends and everybody. Um, one of the most defining characteristics uh, that became readily apparent right away was Tom's sense of duty, his sense of responsibility. And I, I asked him one time, how on earth, when all the rest of us go to work in the morning, you know, we go get our cup of coffee, and we grab our backpack or a briefcase and get in the car and go to work and we're safe and happy and content. Well, maybe not content, you know, some of us like our jobs. Um, but I asked him, how did you climb up into the nose of that bomber, that enormous four engine bomber day after day after day and go up to 20 or 25,000 feet and fly over Germany and Austria with a million Germans trying to shoot you out of the air? And he just looked at me quizzically and said, well, who else was going to do it? He had to, there was no one else. And, you know, he's been someone trying to save the world since he was 18 years old. And, you know, he said, all of us boys from the class of 41 enlisted, we all went off to the war. Some of us didn't come home. Um, but his whole life has been a call to action, you know, a call to responsibility to the rest of us. And, and in addition to that, his self-confidence, because he often told me about one bombing mission they did in Northern Italy and they had very explicit instructions that all of these planes, this huge formation of, of these big four engine Liberator bombers had very explicit instructions on which village to bomb. Um, 
And as they're flying along in formation, all the other planes around him started dropping their bombs and, and Tom did not. And the pilots are sitting above him, behind him, up in the cockpit, and they start screaming at him over the intercom to drop the bombs. Tom is in charge of the plane. He's flying the plane at this point. And they're screaming at him to drop the bombs. And Tom says, no, everyone else is wrong. I am right. And I don't know about you guys, but I tend to think, oh, man, I screwed up. Because if everybody else is doing it, they got to be right. It's statistical probability. And when the planes got back and Tom and one other plane had actually bombed the correct target, he said that all the other navigator bombardiers on all those other planes were met on the runway by generals with truckloads of rifles and were sent to the front lines as infantrymen to replace the American and Canadian soldiers that they had just killed. And Tom then became a squadron navigator in, in the lead plane. And he talked so often about watching other planes that he had flown on with other crew members getting shot out of the air, or breaking apart in the air, and people that he knew falling without parachutes 20,000 feet to the ground. And, and I asked him one time how often he thought about that. And he said, every single day. Yeah, I mean, that haunted him for, for the rest of his, his long life. Um, but that kind of self-confidence has, I don't have it. I always try and strive towards that. But it's the kind of thing where one time he was out in, out, uh, in Sweetwater, out in the Sweetwater, you know, by Jeffrey City. And he saw a couple of bulldozers driving up the ruts of the Oregon Trail, digging up the Oregon Trail ruts and burying a, a, what turned out to be an AT&T communications cable. And it was a Sunday. And Tom, you know, this is back in the days before cell phones. But Tom, you know, the rest of us all would have gone home and sworn and gone to the bar and what a horrible world this is. Tom somehow managed to get the president of AT&T on the phone. The guy was at the golf course out in Virginia or North Carolina or someplace. And Tom got him on the phone and read him the riot act and asked him, do you know what you're doing? And that guy called up the construction crew that afternoon and shut down that travesty the mutilation of one of the nation's most precious historic sites, the Oregon Trail, mm -hmm. running up Sweetwater. And who else would try and do that? No one. The guy was amazing, um, magical. And Rachel, sorry, I know he was your dad and you get tired probably of people talking about him this way, but I loved the man too. <laughs> but um, I mean, it was just incredible. And, and you know, you, you study the story of, of high country news which is not a hippie drug journal, by the way. Um, and I think how he has pushed very young people associated with, with WAC or HCN to get way out of their comfort zone. Maybe he dropped us off the, um, the side of the pool into the deep water before we knew how to swim. I don't know, but got us out of our comfort zone to do things that were terrifying. And, um, but, you know, for him, compared to combat, to being shot at, while you're in a plane at 25,000 feet and cannon shells going off all over around you, you know, risking the ranch, risking his career, you know, us in, in, in jeopardy of being called a son of a bitch by the governor all seemed pretty trivial. And, and that's why he joked about it. And, you know, thanks to Tom now for 30 plus years, I'm in trouble all the time. Somebody's always mad because it's, well, what would Tom do is if I had a bracelet, that's what it would say. Um, but do things that scare you. You know, do things to make the world a better place, do things to keep people and nature safe from the threats. And, and his determination and tenaciousness was just a remarkable example to, to be part of every day, year after year after year after year. And, and yes, I know he was very discouraged at the end of his life and told me a couple of times that he felt sometimes like he had wasted all of his energy trying to save the environment and save the planet. And yet even then he continued to struggle and fight. And, and he never did give up. And it was just such a treat to um, be there with him so close to the action and, and have him for a role model. And so, Rachel, thank you for sharing. He was a great guy. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> thank you so much, Todd. Um, I want to acknowledge just a couple people who I see in the audience. Um, Keith Becker is with us. Keith, I don't know if you can just wave a little bit, but Keith is who I quoted earlier. He was Walk's first executive director. Um, Hi, Colleen. Keith. Colleen Cabot. Hi, Colleen. And Lori Milford. Hi, Lori. Yay. 
Lots of just great memories with all of you. And Bruce Hamilton, I have not met you, but I've certainly read a lot about you in High Country News lore. So welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Is it true you were the, did you take over after the Marstons? Before you were before them? Before. Okay. I was also for 15 minutes the walk executive director. Oh great. <laughs> oh, so let's add that to your to your <laughs> No, I, I moved to Lander when Tom was hiring Joan to be the uh, editor of High Country News. And he said, and Bruce, you can run the outdoor council because Keith Becker can't do that anymore. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, that would be a job. But then he said, but you have to be in Casper. And uh, I said, well, Joan lives in Lander and I want to live in Lander. Uh, he says, okay, well, then I'll hire you both to be in High Country News. <laughs> <laughs> so I never, I never took the walk job, but uh, my wife served on the walk board and uh, it was the best time of my life. And he was like a father to me too, Rachel, but uh, thanks for sharing him. And I remember you from those days and uh, it was wonderful. Great to see you all. Oh, I, I just tell you one other quick story. And that's that uh, after Tom thought he had handed off the paper to us so that we could go run it as these two 20 year olds that were reading the Mother Earth News and making it into a hippie journal. Um, Tom decides he's so mad at Stan Hathaway that he's going to run for governor in order to overturn the politics in Wyoming because he's so mad at Stan Hathaway. And he goes out and buys a new suit. And he talks to a couple people in Casper that are going to bankroll this thing for him. And he's just going to drive around the state and challenge Stan Hathaway in the Republican primary. And uh, so we thought that was the track that Tom was going to take. But then ultimately, Malcolm Wallop stepped into the race and Stan Hathaway jumped out and Tom gave that up and then decided to go to Oregon instead. But uh, that was his brief political career. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, and then the last person I just want to highlight, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple, and I can't see my see everybody on this one screen, but it's John Meinzinski, who um, was a dear friend of Tom's. And John, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you wanted to say anything, um, you know, John continues to lead our citizens for the Red Desert efforts, I think in large part inspired by his own experience in the desert, but also by his relationship with Tom. So I love that that lives on in the work that you and Walk continue to do. Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> you have two or three minutes and then maybe we'll take some questions. <laughs> uh, well, he was a dear friend and I, I, I'm happy to say that uh, we spent some time driving around together in Red Desert trying to figure out how there were different ways to protect areas. But about a year before he died, he, uh, he took me to dinner at the Maverick restaurant and asked me um, if I would um, be willing to throw his ashes off of Oregon Buttes. And uh, he said he, he didn't really want a celebration or a lot of people. It was more of a private thing because we shared this one thing where I went to the Red Desert in 1967 to work out some personal things I had to deal with, one of which was whether to go to Vietnam or not. And I eventually did enlist in the Air Force next year because I wanted to fly too. <laughs> and uh, We talked about airplanes for a long time on that one. But when I went up to throw his ashes off of Oregon Buttes, he, I remember him saying, well, I hope it's not one of those really windy days where <laughs> it all blows back in your face. We were laughing about his ashes, really. And um, I went up there, and it, it turned out it was a horribly windy day. It's just one of those days where I had to brace myself walking up that narrow ridge line you go to the top from the Oregon Buttes Road. And uh, I got up to a certain point where it's a steep cliff off of the south side or the um, east side. And the wind was howling over that. And I was trying to stay off of that edge. And I saw that there were three points where you could throw ashes off of where the steep cliff was. Three little points that jutted out. And I was trying to decide which one would be the one to go on because they were like a, a quarter mile apart each. 
And uh, just then this, I was startled by this giant black winged thing that flew right in my face. It was probably 15 feet from my face. And it was an, a golden eagle that caught an updraft. It was about 15 feet in front of me and it flew straight up in the air. I was totally startled by it. It went up and then it dove down to the nearest jutting point that came out of that cliff. And then I knew where, where I was supposed to go to throw the ashes off and said, thanks, Tom. And went there. When I got there, the wind stopped. And I was able to have a little goodbye ceremony and a little, little uh, sweet grass or uh, uh, sacred sage and threw his ashes off in a gentle breeze. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions. And feel free to put them in the chat or Keith, if you wanted to say something, or Colleen, I didn't want to overlook either of you. Or Lori. <laughs> well, maybe John, you said it best. So we could leave it at that. Um, I do have just some closing thoughts from Bart Kohler, who really wanted to be with us today. He couldn't make it. Um, a lot of us know Bart, he's had an entire career himself in conservation. Um, he was WALK's second um, executive director. And at least the story that we all tell, um, not too often, thankfully, anymore, but the story goes that when Bart was uh, the director of the Wyoming Outdoor Council, he wrote a letter to the then board of directors that said, consulted our checking account $875 balance, please advise. And um, luckily we're not in that, in those dire straits anymore, thankfully. So maybe another miracle the way Paul described it. But Bart yesterday sent me this little tribute and I thought I'd just share it as a closing thought. He said, Tom was the best. There's no question about that. He was Wyoming's Paul Revere for telling the dramatic environmental changes facing us on the horizon. He fearlessly defended Wyoming against all attacks. He saw each threat as personal because it was. And we lucky ones followed Tom into the fray and, because better people, and became better people as a result. Now his spirit faces the west wind, holding a smile that guards all things good and wild in Wyoming for today and for all of our tomorrows. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you immensely to our panelists and for all of you for joining. We did record today. So if you know somebody who, who couldn't make it today, we'll send out a link. Well, seeing you all, just a treat. Thanks for the stories. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great seeing a lot of you that I haven't seen in a long time. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.